Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Good morning, people who are here as well. Um, yeah, it's my privilege to do the next of our uh, series on He Restores My Soul. And I really think the title tells you uh, everything you need to know about the series so far, that we're looking to God for our restoration. Um, I really like what Jody said on um, week one, which was that actually he restores my soul really means that he brings my soul back. And I think over the last year and a half, uh, there's been so many things happening that have challenged and got at our soul, our sense of who we are. So many of the things that we would have relied on to be part of our structure and, and tell us that we're okay have gone. Uh, things have changed. And then even when they've come back, they've not quite been the same. And so into that, we need God to restore our souls. We need to look to our relationship with God and to our trust of him to restore something in us. Um, John Mark Comer puts it this way. We live in a noisy, busy world that does violence to our souls. And that language is quite strong. It's maybe stronger than you would have thought of using, but I think it's right. I think there's something in our sense of who we are and our, our, the health of our souls that actually is really challenged by noisiness and busyness uh, and just everything else that goes with that. Uh, and, and John Mark Comer is a guy that I uh, really like. I'd encourage you to listen to or read any of his stuff. Uh, he's the guy who wrote The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, which we've recommended a number of times. And Bridgetown Church, uh, you can find online, they do a whole series uh, about practicing the way um, of Jesus and really uh, go deeper into some of these spiritual disciplines and habits. Uh, and some of that is what this series is based on. So absolutely going to recommend that and point you towards it. And as Jody said, 21 days of praying and fasting, maybe there's another discipline. Uh, and I'm here to advocate silence and solitude. Uh, during those 21 days, find some time to be still. And I mean, that song summed up a lot of what it is. It's taking time to allow God to restore our souls. And there's different ways to do that. But really their understanding of what it means to be a disciple or the word Talmudim is actually an apprentice of Jesus. And we often make it more complicated than it needs to be because the things that are important in being an apprentice to Jesus are being with Jesus, that we might become like Jesus. And then we would walk around and do the things that he would do if it was him walking around and not us. And when you frame it that way, it's a much simpler thing. And I think, oh, actually, I think I can do that. And sometimes we make it this really hard thing that we have to do this and this and this. But actually, it should start with us being with Jesus and, and our, our souls being restored in that moment. Because church is busy, life is busy, and somehow busyness in our culture has become somewhere between a status symbol and just an accepted reality. But if it's doing violence to our souls. It's not how we're meant to live. And if we live the same as everyone else, we don't have that sense of connection with God, of being restored, then we won't have that, that life to be able to share with other people. There's a business phrase that says, uh, the way that you're set up is perfectly designed to get the results you're getting. And it's the same in our lives. If our lives are full of X, Y, and Z, it's probably because your life is designed that way. And so the challenge is actually on us to have a look at our own lives. And it may be that things need to be stripped out and, and simplified. And in a sense, maybe that's happened already over the last year and a half. But my challenge is don't put back the things that aren't right, that aren't good for you, that are just busy but don't bring life, that aren't what God's calling you to do. Don't fill up your life, and I need to not fill my life, with the things uh, from the past. Uh, that aren't supposed to be there. And that's been a real challenge. And, and some of the things and the busyness that what has tried to creep its way back in, I've been like, no, actually, I don't want that back. Uh, and something in our simplicity is to keep that. And we've got to try and keep that simplicity so that we can lean into some of these things that will genuinely give us life. Now, if you want to be a runner, then you have to do training. You have to get out and run. You have to begin to do that. If you want to be a musician, you need to practice. You need to play and you need to learn how to develop your technique. Similarly, if you want to be someone who's well-read, guess what? You have to read. Uh, otherwise, you won't be knowledgeable and you won't be able to do that. All of these things take an intentionality and uh, a sense of training to get there. And following Jesus is no different. If we want to be these apprentices of Jesus, then we need to carve out time to be with him. We can't just suddenly turn up to a marathon thinking, well, it doesn't matter if I haven't done any running to this point. I'll probably be good at it. 
It's not going to happen. Same with our relationship with God. We need to give time to it and we need to make space for it. Otherwise, we can want to be much closer to God and have that sense of a peaceful life and a peaceful soul. But if we're not putting time in, we're not finding those spaces, uh, then it's really not uh, going to happen. Um, I want to read from John 14 because uh, Jesus is the way to be one with him. The way to be close to him is through the Holy Spirit. And so in John 14, verse 16, uh, Jesus says this, And I will ask the Father, and he'll give you another advocate to help you. And he will be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. That sense of the Holy Spirit being the way that we can be with Jesus. We can be aware of Jesus. We can have that sense of, I know God is with me today in this moment. I know he's with me right now. I know he's with me when I'm going through this or that. And I want to just share this uh, quote, should appear on the screen as well, from John Mark Comer again. He says this, the first and primary goal of apprenticeship to Jesus is learning to live in a constant state of awareness of and connection to the Holy Spirit. Constant state of awareness and connection with the Holy Spirit. And that's John 14. And if you know John 15 that follows on from it, it talks all about abiding. And we're going to read a bit of that now Uh, from verse four. It says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you'll bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you're like a branch thrown away that withers. Such branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. And this is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. So this is how we show we're God's disciples. We abide in him. We spend time with him. We find out how to have that life of God in everything. It's it's abiding. It's remaining It's at least 10 times in that passage, it's talking about being close, being connected to, being with. And it's kind of like learning to be in two places at once. So maybe you're on the school run, but you're also connected to the Holy Spirit. Maybe you're traveling on the tube or you're driving to work or you're at your desk at work, but you're aware of the Holy Spirit with you. Mm. Whatever you're doing, it's, it's like having that acknowledgement that the presence of God is with me, even though I'm here. Because as much as we like to, reality and life won't allow us to go away for a month at a time and get all topped up and then come back kind of full of the the Holy Spirit of God. God's design is that we learn to live in a rhythm that is restful, a rhythm that is connected to God, but has time to be with God in the middle of it. Uh, Brother Lawrence, a famous monk, refers to this as practicing the presence of God, that awareness of having that. And it comes with intentionality. And 1 Thessalonians 5 talks about praying without ceasing. Mm. Almost that sense of you begin a prayer when you wake up in the morning and you just leave it open. Mm -hmm. You don't ever amen it and and kind of park it. You just keep praying. You keep connecting. You keep being aware of the Holy Spirit the whole way through. Uh, And here's another quote that I was really challenged by. That's by a guy called William Paulsell. He says the following, It is unlikely that we will deepen our relationship with God in a casual or haphazard manner. There will be a need for some intentional commitment and some reorganization in our own lives. But there is nothing that will enrich our lives more than a deeper and clearer perception of God's presence in the routine of daily living. Isn't that great? I mean, you might need to go back to that because it's it's such a deep um, quote there. But that's what it's about. It's not just going to happen naturally. You know, any of the examples I used earlier, the runner, the musician, uh, the person who wants to be well read, all of those take that intentionality. Uh, But maybe life feels too busy to start adding in this or adding in that. So maybe we need a simpler life first. And this is partly where these spiritual disciplines or habits come in. It's how do we find space and time to do some of these things that will bring us life? And if you look at the life of Jesus, then obviously they're all there. So we're going to do that now. We're going to look at a few examples where he absolutely did these things. And we'll start 
with Matthew 4. Uh, Matthew 4 is just after Jesus was uh, baptized and he's led into the wilderness. Uh, Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. No no surprise there. And this is a passage that I've always uh, misunderstood. I've always um, thought it was firstly strange that the Holy Spirit would lead Jesus into a place where he was A, hungry, and then B, tempted by the devil. I thought that was a bit harsh that he would do that. But secondly, I've always thought of the wilderness or solitude or those kind of things as something to be avoided. I don't particularly um, want to spend all my time on my own. I like people. I like noise. Um, I like um, being in community. So for me, I, I, I didn't quite understand this. And the key lies in the word for wilderness, which is used, which is eremos. And basically, eremos can be translated as a whole number of different ways. It can be translated as desert, desert place or deserted place. It can be translated as wilderness, but it can also be translated as quiet place or solitary place. And if you look at the life of Jesus, he would intentionally spend time finding quiet places where he could connect with God. And when you understand that, you realize it's a complete flip. It's not that, oh, yeah, of course the enemy was going to have a go at him when he was tired and hungry and on his own. It was actually only in that place where he'd been fasting for a month and a half, totally connected to God, that he was able to face up to the devil and come away unscathed. Actually, that wilderness, that quiet place, that time spent there was the reason he was able to succeed. As he was connected to his father, it's not a place of weakness. It's a place of his greatest strength. And that's why he revisited it again and again and again. People will be like, Jesus, come and do this. We need you to do this. We need you to do this. He's like, no, (laughs) sorry, I've got to do this. Because if I don't do this, then my soul will be tired. It will be heavy. It won't be ready to do the things that God has for me. And we need to look at that and go, ah, if I'm not prioritizing that quiet place, that um, wilderness, then actually I'm not uh, getting that same sense of refreshing that Jesus is. And that's really what silence and solitude is all about. It's finding that place. And in our busy lives, it's, it's harder than ever to find it. But here's another example. Luke 4, uh, verse 42. At daybreak, Jesus went out to, you've guessed it, an Eremos, a solitary place. He withdrew. He was in demand. He was doing amazing things. People wanted to be all around him. But he knew there was something more important. He prioritized rest. He prioritized getting away. He knew that he needed to do that in order to do the other things. And it wasn't just something that was important for him. He absolutely trained his disciples in this. He said, listen, this is the way to survive. This is the way to do ministry. Um, Here's another example from Mark 6. Uh, Then because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, he said to them, that's the disciples, come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. So they went away by themselves in a boat to a solitary place. It's the same word again. And I felt like as I was reading that um, in this last week, that God was, that was God's invitation to some of the people watching to some of us. It's this invitation to me as well. Come with me by yourself to a quiet place and get some rest. And there's probably many different things that help you to find rest, but I would absolutely encourage you not to neglect time in the presence of God. And we need it. If Jesus needed it, then we absolutely need it. We need to find the Eremos, the, the place where we can connect with God, because otherwise we can't live every day in the power of God, connected to God, aware of where he's leading us and guiding us because we haven't, we haven't been able to hear that. We haven't been able to connect with that. And it's almost like these days it's, it's actually okay for all of us to have this low level anxiety about almost everything. And it's just so much a part of who we are that we don't even question it anymore. Just like, how was your day? Stressful. How was your day? busy how you know and it, it's 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 almost like i said earlier it's this kind of status symbol this like you know i've, I've done it i've achieved it because i had a busy day or, or, or a stressful week or a, that's not how we're supposed to live but but this sense of how on earth do i find time to
to connect with God when I've got no space, I think is a really important question for us to work out. And part of it is finding a quiet place, but part of it is pres- practicing the presence of God wherever we are, whatever's going on. And it can be an amazing gift. Um, and I'd really encourage you, if this is the kind of thing you think, I just don't know how to do it, then um, John Mark Comer's church, which we said about, do a whole series called Practicing the Way, and they have teaching resources on it, and they even have small group resources on it. They have six small group sessions just on silence and solitude. Um, so they, they're really mining it. They're really taking it seriously and going, right, we want to know everything about silence and solitude. <laughs> and so if you want to find out more about it, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit now about some of the ways that they do that. Um, because I'm always up for practical application. Uh, I'm a bit of a pragmatist, so I'm like, I hear you. How do I do it? <laughs> like, tell me how to do it. Otherwise, uh, I get a bit frustrated. Uh, so there's six ways, kind of six areas of this kind of silence and solitude that they lean into. Uh, and so I want to just kind of talk you through a few of them uh, now. First one that they focus on uh, is breathing prayer and abiding. Um, and so what do they mean by this? Well, we've talked about abiding already. Um, that sense of, of being with God, connecting with God, remembering who we are in him and, and not trying to do it on our own. But breathing prayer is, is effectively being aware of your breathing. So um, I want you to have a go at this. It's actually going to be hard for me to do it while I count you in. Um, so you just do it and I'll tell you how to do it. But it's very simply um, breathing in for four seconds, holding it for four seconds, and then breathing out for four seconds. Now, I know you're thinking, that sounds easy. I'm an expert at breathing. Well, I'm sure you are, <laughs> but you're going to find this harder than you think. Okay, so just, so let's, <laughs> it's good preparation for labor as well, if you believe it. Um, okay, so let's try it. Let's try breathing in for four seconds. Ready? One, two, three, four, and hold it. One, two, three, four, and breathe out. One, two, three, four. Try again. Breathe in. One, two, three, four. Hold it. One, two, three, four. And breathe out. One, two, three, four. Now, I practiced this myself and it's, I found it really hard to actually breathe in for as long as four seconds. <laughs> I was like, oh, I'm full after about two. Um, <laughs> But partly we're not used to just slowing down, even something as simple as our breathing. And so it's a simple thing, but even just say you've got 10 minutes, you say, okay, I'm going to spend this time with God. Maybe start with just being aware of your breathing, just being aware of the kind of almost the pace. It's like breathe, 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 next thing, next thing, next thing. But to slow down your breathing is a really good uh, first thing to do. And, And in fact, lots of these Um, Six things that they talk about, when you look through the resources, they start with being aware of breathing and posture and things like that that are simple, but actually make a real difference. Uh, Secondly, I want to just uh, talk about emotional health. They talk about being aware of your emotions uh, and almost to the point where after you've done your breathing, you're sitting and you're kind of aware of, oh, I felt really angry today or I felt really upset today. And kind of asking the question, okay, grief, what are you doing here? Or or anger, why are you here? Uh, Just almost sitting with God in the rawness of the emotions that you're feeling. Because for most of us, and this is me included, we bury our emotions or we think they're not a good thing um, to let them run wild. Like it's okay if if you're uncontrollably laughing, although doesn't that always happen when you're not allowed to actually laugh? (laughs) But some of the other ones we tend to bury and hide because actually don't want to sit in my grief or I don't want to sit in my anger. I want to just distract myself with something else. And so in this particular exercise, it's sitting with God, with the emotions that you're feeling and just bringing them to God and being okay with that, saying, actually, I am an emotional being. It's okay to have felt this emotion, but maybe let's look at why, what's it landing on, what's it caused by, and let's invite God and the Holy Spirit in uh, to help us with that. Uh, The third one they talk about is casting care. Now, if you've done um, Jesus ministry course before, um, it's actually quite similar to that. Um, if you haven't done it before, I'll just give you a little summary of some of the teaching. It's about recognizing, so there's five R's, recognizing actually what are some of the things or areas of my life where it's not completely submitted to God or it's kind of not, it's not quite right. 
Uh, and so it's recognizing something that's out of place. It could be a lie that you're believing about yourself or about God or just something you recognize. And that's bringing it to God and kind of repenting of it, saying, God, I'm sorry that I believed you were uh, distant or disinterested. I'm sorry for where I agreed with that. And instead, I choose to believe that you are close, you're interested, you are with me. And so it's some of that kind of thing. Now, and the rest of the R's, because I'm sure you've noticed, I've only said a couple. It's about receiving God's forgiveness about that, about kind of rebuking the enemy where he's landed on that and seek, sought to influence your life over that. And then finally replacing it with the truth and with the Holy Spirit's confirmation of who we are. And so this kind of casting care, I mean, it comes from 1 Peter 5, 7. It says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And so it's that awareness of actually God cares for us. Like, don't know what your picture is of God and you think about spending 10 minutes just sitting with God. What's the picture of the, of the God you're coming to? Actually cast your cares to him because he cares for you. If nothing else, no, God cares for you and he's interested in you and in your life. Uh, the last, uh, fourth one, sorry, listening prayer. Um, it's similar to casting care in a lot of ways. Um, and it's similar to the Jesus ministry uh, training as well, because it talks about protecting the time. Actually, there's so many things we can hear. How do we know if it's God or not God? And so that sense of actually, God, I pr pray you protect this time that I may hear clearly from you. And then having time to listen to God. What's he saying? Maybe he's highlighting something where you're struggling with some unforgiveness or uh, there's something that you need to bring to him uh, and see um, God come into it and bring a change. Uh, number five, Lectio Divina. Now, um, there's a lot of people I know who have been doing the uh, Lectio 365 app. A um, few people in the room. And I have to say, it's brilliant. It's absolutely brilliant. Um, I don't do it every day. I sometimes forget or sometimes I just don't get around to it. But if you download the app, in fact, if you want one practical thing to do after this talk, download that app. And then there's a 10 minute reflection meditation for the morning and then another one for the evening. And you don't even have to concentrate and be silent by yourself. It literally leads you through uh, and it takes a, a simple passage of scripture. It looks at it, then it talks about it, then it looks at it again. And it's based on this kind of pause, kind of rest and reflect, then ask and then yield. And so this, this sense of submitting to God. And then I love it at the end, it goes, as we prepare to take <laughs> what we've heard into the day, uh, and it's a sense of actually, it is good, but it's good now because you're going to take that with you into your day. And so I definitely recommend, have a go at Lectio Divina. Uh, uh, and the app is called Lectio, L-E-C-T-I-O 365. Um, and it's Pete Gregg and a whole load of other guys who are brilliant. So we'd recommend that. And then the last one, the sixth one they talk about is retreat. Now, most of these so far, I don't know uh, what you've been thinking of, but I've been thinking of about 10 minutes each. I was like, yeah, we can do 10 minutes of this, 10 minutes of this, 10 minutes of this. A retreat is more like hours <laughs> rather than minutes. So you might say, right, I'm going to retreat for eight hours. And so there's definitely time for a nap in there for an hour. But you might also do some Lectio Divina for a bit. So it's the idea of actually, what if you actually gave this some proper time? A 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, actually, how much will that um, really help us? Um, or, or maybe you need a bit longer. And I think about the history of the Christian faith and the you know, monks, nuns, people who spend hours and hours in prayer and contemplation of God. And I think we are a very fast culture. And speed and spirituality don't really go very well together. Actually, if we don't slow down, we're going to struggle to engage spiritually and meaningfully with God. Um, but here's a few top tips if you are going to have a go at some point this week, which I recommend you do. Uh, firstly, identify a time and a place. Um, actually, if, you have, if you're working from home and you have a desk or somewhere like that, I would suggest that is not the right place. <laughs> to try and then suddenly change into a gear where you're going to be listening to God and ready to connect with him. That's just not a good starter. Uh, secondly, set a modest goal. Don't go in for the eight hours first time round. Okay, that will be too much. Equally, 10 minutes will be hard. Um, you probably think, what are you talking about? 10 minutes would be easy. It's not, it's really hard. And actually, if you manage one or two minutes of just really peaceful connecting with God out of that 10, you're doing well. Um, so keep that in mind. Thirdly, remove distractions. Um, one of the biggest distractions, the easiest one to go for is our phones. We touch our phones over 2,000 times every day. 
uh, for various reasons, but if you're serious about having some time, you need to turn it off, put it on silent, put it in a different room, um, just to avoid uh, that. And there's, there may be other distractions and things as well. Like I said, you're, the desk where you also work or you also do other things may not be that helpful. And then lastly, be aware of your posture and your breathing, kind of simple physical things, uh, but that make a difference. And this last bit, you can't fail or succeed at this. So you can't go into it thinking, I'm gonna be the best at silence and solitude, I'm gonna win. And then if you miss a day, oh, I've lost. Like it's, not, it's the wrong mindset, it's the wrong mentality. Actually, it's about showing up and it's about being patient and it's about allowing God to transform us. And in a sense, yes, the more time we spend with God, the more he can transform us, but it's not a win and a lose. And, and lots of this, they recommend you actually do in community. So it's not just what can I do with my journey, but it's how do we implement these things together? And, and maybe in a small group, if you're part of one, or if you've got some really good friends, maybe next time you get together, why don't you spend 10 minutes just resting in the presence of God together? Um, obviously, that might be interesting if some of your friends don't know God, but <laughs> hey, they can still uh, have a go, or maybe they'll just have a nap. But something about doing it together, which I think will help uh, and make it easier to do as well. A couple of thoughts to finish with. Uh, the listening prayer one, one of the reasons I really like that idea of, of spending time just listening to God is in John 10, it talks about uh, us being sheep and we're God's sheep and we know his voice. Actually, I think we get to know his voice as we spend time listening. Uh, but I also find that encouraging that God calls us sheep because sheep wander off and they go and do their own thing and they might come back if you call them, but then they'll wander off again. I think it, it's encouraging because it's like God doesn't have any illusions about, you know, we're going to make it every day and we're going to do this. Like there's some grace and some, he knows we're sheep. Imagine yourself as a sheep. Yeah, actually, that's all right. I can do that role. I can be that. But then he leans into that metaphor and says, you're sheep, but I'm shepherd. So actually, it's my role to care for you. It's my role to talk to you, to lead you, to guide you, to, to have you close with me. And I find that really encouraging. If the goal is to be with Jesus and become like him, then that shepherd and sheep, that, you know, rabbi and disciple or apprentice, learning from him, time with him, I think is really um, important. Now, I want to finish with a story um, about a lady called Susanna Wesley. Now, interestingly, this was on the Lectio 365 app um, a couple of days ago. She had 19 children nine of whom didn't make it past infancy. She had 10 children who did, three boys and seven girls. And two of them were famously John and Charles Wesley, who wrote many hymns and founded Methodism. But the really interesting thing is her spirituality and her spiritual life. And imagine having 10 children around you and her way of finding, like I said earlier, presence of God, but also 10 children, mm -hmm was that she had an apron. And I don't know if it said do not disturb on it, but she would lift the apron up over her head, probably with the kids going crazy around her. And they knew that if she had her apron over her head, she was not to be disturbed. And she went on to um, disciple all of those and hundreds of other people as well. Um, and she was an incredible example of someone who found practicing the presence of God in the midst of chaos. And your life may feel like chaos. You may feel like, I can't do this but she found a way to connect with God in the midst of it. And I want to read her prayer to you. She says this, Help me, O Lord, to remember that religion is not to be confined to the church or the closet, nor exercised only in prayer and meditation, but that everywhere I am in your presence. So may my every word and action have a moral content. May all the happenings of my life prove useful and beneficial to me. May all things instruct me and afford me an opportunity of exercising some virtue and daily learning and growing towards your likeness. Amen. And so her prayer, her awareness was that every moment, every single thing that happened could be something that God could use to shape her and to lead her and to guide her. And she found a way to connect with him. And I really like the thought 
of actually our primary thing is to just be with Jesus and become like him. Because that feels like something that I want to do and something that I can do. And then to do that with a whole load of other people who are passionate about that as well. Then I think we will have something different to offer to the world because we'll respond to the same challenges, but in a different way. The band's going to come back and lead us in a song now. But I'd just like to pray uh, for you, but for me as well, and for us uh, as a church community, actually, that we'll be able to find that eremos, that place of solitude or quiet or peace or whatever it is. So, Father, we thank you for the example. Thank you for John Mark Comer and his church. Thank you for Susanna Wesley. Thank you for people who've gone before to show us the way. Thank you for Jesus' example. Thank you that he was able to prioritise that time with you, that solitary place. Father, may we seek to emulate him. May we find those spaces and those places. And maybe it starts with breathing. Maybe it starts with 10 minutes. But however we do it, may we connect with you. May we be able to be with you. And would you restore our souls? Would you bring them back from the the violence and the chaos of the world? Would we instead find hope and life and beauty in connecting with you? And Father, would you help us? We can't do it on our own. May the Holy Spirit inspire us and lead us and guide us. And may we remember that we are your people. In Jesus' name, amen.